Amen? So we're good now. Colossians. We're in Colossians chapter 1. We're going to finish up Colossians chapter 1. Actually, we're going to go into a little bit of chapter 2 today. So I see you've got your words open. If you've got your Bible, uh, your, your phone, go ahead and turn to it on your, in your app. Uh, those online, I invite you to do that as well, wherever you may find yourself. Uh, one of the reasons, I, I want to remind us, one of the reasons that we are making our way through a book such as Colossians is it becomes idolatry when we attempt to study Scripture or a preacher even preaches through Scripture when we just hit bits and pieces of the Word of God. It, that's idolatry, really, because God intends for us to see the whole picture, see the full picture of what he's wanting us to, to have and to see and to know. And so Colossians, we're doing that. We want to know the Jesus as he truly is. Because as you know, uh, the believers in the church at Colossae were being attacked. Their belief in Jesus, they were hearing false Jesus being taught. Uh, false teachings were going on. And so it's very important today, because that's going on today, in our world today, a lot of false Jesus being proclaimed. A lot of false teaching going on. And so we get to know God by taking every line of Scripture seriously. But that's not always easy, right? And especially in Colossians, and especially today, it's certainly not going to be easy. And so I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to have the time to be able to look at line by line. So I, I basically organized it over th with three points. I looked at different uh, commentators and how they organize the material and everybody had a different way of organizing it so I've come up with these three ways that I feel like we can organize it and look at it uh, again not being able to go line by line I invite you to do that on your own uh, this week this afternoon or later this week uh, look at the text in in detail and see what God would say to you through his word today but uh, we're going to look at it beginning with verse 25 uh, and I'm going to read down, I'm going to read, start with verse 24 actually and read down through verse 5. Uh, listen and follow along with me as uh, we listen to uh, what Paul says through the, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Verse 26, the mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to us his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery which is Christ in you. The hope of glory him we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ for this I toil and struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me chapter 2 verse 1 for I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea, for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that in no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. What a powerful and wonderful passage of Scripture. and How I've organized it is this way. We're going to first of all look at Let's see suffering with Jesus for the joy that it is. Secondly, let's receive the privilege of proclaiming Christ. And thirdly, let's plan on the power of Christ. So let's look at verse 24. It starts off, let's see suffering with Jesus for the joy that it is. Look what he says in verse 24. Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am 
filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now, what in the world is Paul talking about there? It, this verse is the key to the whole thing. Uh, we've got to get this, and I could talk a whole month. I wish I could on this one verse. It is so loaded with what we need to understand, and so I'm going to try to condense it down for us today. Uh, it, but we've got to look at what does it mean, but what does it not mean? Let's do that first. It does not mean Jesus did not suffer all that he needed to suffer so that we could be forgiven of our sins. It does not mean that. We know when Jesus hung on the cross, what were the last words he said? It is finished. What's finished? The suffering required as a payment for bearing the sins of the world, of the entire world. Amen? It was complete when he spoke those words on the cross through his blood. So you've got to understand, it really gets this text, you've got to understand how connected Christians are to Jesus. If you're a Christian today, you're connected to Jesus, but you got to get, you got to really get that. You got to kind of have that going in your mind if you're going to understand what Paul is talking about here. It's not just that I feel God, Jesus, that He loves me. He has strong, loving feelings for me. Yes, He does uh, through the Holy Spirit. But what we need to realize is that we, Jesus, not we, but Jesus, was has actually united Himself with us. He's united himself with us. It's kind of like Jesus and you have a central nervous system. Amen? You share a central nervous system. But what's this phrase, I am filling up what is lacking? What in the world is Paul saying there? He's saying that he is in his own body. Hear me now. He's saying to the believers in this church, in his body, he actually is the personal representation of, of how Jesus feels about them. That's what he's saying. And that he has experienced sufferings, and when he suffers, Jesus suffers with him. And that's what I want you to get out of this first verse, that Jesus suffers with you when you suffer. And, and so there's some suffering that has still got to take place for the church, is what Paul is pointing out here. There's still some suffering left for you and I, for the church, to experience for it to take place before Jesus does return. Amen? So he's left some sufferings for us. It's not, and it's not just about Paul here. The gospel gets from heart to heart. How, do, how does the gospel go from heart to heart? How did the gospel go from your heart to maybe your spouse's heart or maybe a family member's heart or a friend's heart? And how did it go from heart to heart? Simple. It goes through acts of dying love. Paul experienced that. Jesus also did. It showed that in his life. Paul certainly understood that. And Colossian believers, that's how they got it. That's how you got it in your heart. Here's what Paul is saying. Somebody filled up what was lacking in the area of affliction with your life. Someone. That's right. In other words, somebody suffered for you in the same way that Jesus would suffer for you if he was walking on this earth. Now, you would never say that about yourself. You would never say that. But the Bible says that. If Jesus was here walking with us right now, he would do the very things that the Apostle Paul did. And that's what you should be doing as well is the point that he's making. That's exactly what you are to be doing, we are to be doing. Not just suffering for Jesus, but su actually suffering with Jesus when we do the work of Jesus. Let me say that again. Not just suffering for Jesus, but suffering with Jesus. Are you hearing what, he's, what God's saying here? That you're suffering with Jesus when you do the work of Jesus in the world. Literally, the translation there, you see flesh, and then you got body. Literally, it's my flesh for his body in the Greek. Your body, and what God, Paul is saying there, is your body, hear me now, is an instrument of the love of God in this world. Did you know that? That's right. Your body is an instrument of God's love in the world. Now, the relevance for you and I today 
uh, they, in Paul's day, he was helping them to realize that, that the body, their body, and the suffering that they were experiencing and he had experienced was actually in, united with Jesus. His, Jesus is suffering. Affliction that Jesus had gone through. And so uh, we need to understand in relevance today, uh, the way I thought of how to put it is, why do you have a body? Why do I have a body? It's not for sexual fulfillment. Hear me. We have a body, the Bible teaches. It's a fulfillment. What Paul is saying, your body is a fulfillment of the sufferings of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. That's what your body's all about. Did you know that? That's right. It is a fulfillment of the sufferings of Christ for a lost and dying world. You mean, Brother Dave, that my body I can use for the glory of King Jesus, the risen King above? Absolutely. That's the reason God gave you your body. That's what Paul's pointing out to the believers, to us. That's the reason he gave you your body. When we can't understand this, Paul's saying, I've got joy in suffering in his body unless we understand the magnitude of Jesus. Amen? Unless we understand the magnitude, the bigness of Jesus Christ. See, we answer the call to Jesus at whatever the cost. And can I tell you, it will cost. The call to Jesus will cost, right? We know that. Those of us who have responded to that call. And to be willing to suffer at the least to endure hardship, some hardship for the sake of the church. That's what Paul is saying there. And so, let's see suffering with Jesus for the joy that it is. And let's have joy in our suffering. That's what God wants us to see out of that first verse. But let's look at verses 25 through 28. And the second thing I want to highlight for us, let's receive the privilege of proclaiming Christ. Let's receive the privilege of proclaiming Christ. Look at verse 25. Look what it says. Verse 25 says, Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. Verse 27, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles, in other words, uh, not, not Jesus just for the Jews. Do you catch what Paul's saying? It's for you. I don't believe we have a, a, any one of the Jewish race with us today, but we're all Gentiles, and so aren't you glad? <laughs> aren't you glad the mystery of, the, of Christ, the mystery of the gospel, has come, has been revealed, disclosed to us Gentiles, uh, the riches of his glory, this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now notice down in the next verse, in him... We what? We proclaim. There it is. It's a privilege that you and I have to proclaim him. In him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may what? Present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Did you notice three times the word everyone? Did you catch that? key word everyone we can never settle as a church to be a church that's not for everyone amen we should never settle to be a church that's not for everyone we exist Paul is saying to proclaim Jesus and you may have not been called to be a minister of the church or be on the staff of the church but hear me today if you're a Christian you are carrying the knowledge, the only knowledge that will save a soul. Wow. Think about that. You are carrying, if you're a Christian, the only knowledge that can save souls. Amen? You're carrying that as a follower, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul's pointing out. Everyone who has been brought near through the blood of Jesus Christ is a carrier of the mystery of Christ that's been revealed it's been revealed to you amen been revealed to you what that Jesus took on your sin took on the sins of everybody when he went to that cross and his flesh on that cross was was carrying was bearing your sins everybody's sins on that cross and then of course 
he came off that cross after he died, breathed his last. They put him in a tomb, and as the prophecy was given, three days later, he rose from the dead. So you've seen that, amen? You know the mystery of Christ. Christ in you now if you have truly put your faith and trust in him. So notice what Paul's saying. He's saying to you and me that you can have clarity about who God is. You can have clarity about who he is and what God wants for the world today. You got what Abraham did not have. <laughs> Abraham didn't have that. King David didn't have that. You've got the mystery of Christ that they did not have the benefit of. Amen? That's a powerful, powerful thing. You already possess that mystery. And if you have faith in Jesus, did you catch what Paul said? You're a steward of the gospel. You're a steward. You're a manager of the gospel. Therefore, we are to proclaim. It's a privilege to proclaim Christ. Amen? Do you, do you experience that in your life? I pray you do. The privilege of a proclaiming Christ to a family member that doesn't know Jesus or a friend that doesn't know Jesus or someone that you meet at Walmart or, or at the store or at lunch or supper or wherever you may find yourselves. Do you not experience that when you share Christ? It gets kind of caught up in you. I know it does me. It gets caught up in me, that, that sense of what a privilege God has given me to proclaim Christ that, that Abraham didn't have and King David didn't have and a bunch of those Old Testament folks didn't have. But we have, thanks to, again, the glory of Christ revealed in Jesus Christ. What a wonderful, wonderful truth. We, and, and so we need to understand the glory is what will belong to every... The glory here is not glory that you're going to get now. This glory that he's talking about is when you go to heaven. That's the glory you're going to get when you get to heaven. Amen? Think about it. You're going to be in heaven, and you get to have a body just like Jesus Christ. Think about that for a moment. You will have a body just like Jesus. And so your body will be like Jesus' body. Think about that. With Christ. In heaven, with Christ. That's what Paul's pointing out here. And we need to keep reminding ourselves and others that Christ lives in you by the Spirit. Look what it says again. Verse uh, 27. Which is the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. That's hope not that you would get but it's talking about the future hope that you will experience in heaven when you have a body just like Jesus. Amen? And so you got to understand, uh, the body uh, was, was not a popular subject, especially in the culture in which uh, this church is. Um, the body was seen to be disposable, that it really didn't have that much significance. And so Paul is saying the exact opposite. Uh, the, the Greeks thought that, that the body was just something that's going to be, you're going to get rid of it. But, but Paul's the opposite is what he's teaching here. The body is so very important because in it we experience the sufferings of Christ. Amen? That's part of our purpose for being here. That's why our body is the Lord's. Amen? Your body is the Lord's. That's what Paul wants you to get here, what God wants you to get through Paul. And so he says, we have a privileged calling in regards to that. His presence in you, what does it do in you? It encourages you, it strengthens you, it sustains you, and you have that privilege then. God is not going to waste your life. Can I get an amen today? God will never waste your life. He's got a plan for your life. He's going to use it for his glory, for his benefit. Again, for the gospel to be proclaimed is what he wants to see happen through your body, through your afflictions, through your sufferings. Because when you suffer, you are doing it with Jesus. Amen? Jesus, right now, if you're in pain, Jesus has that pain also. Hello? You have joy today? Jesus has that joy also. So we got to understand that if you're going to grasp what God is saying here in his word about suffering, seeing suffering through the joy, that it's a joy. The suffering with Christ is for joy that we're to have and experience. I mean, what greater purpose than that, amen, could be added to your life than what he's already given you, the mysteries of the glory of God, the glory of Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
You know what our lips are for? He tells us there in that verse, what are our lips for? To proclaim him. Him we proclaim. And there's a warning. Did you see that? There's a warning that's a part of the gospel message. We warn people we love. Amen? We need to warn people that we love. Why? No one talked about hell more than Jesus Christ did. He talked about it more than anything. And so we need to warn people is what Paul's saying. Part of proclaiming the gospel Christ is we warn people of coming judgment. We warn people that they need to get their life right with Jesus before it's too late. And so we are warned, but we teach. And listen, warning people is not easy. I had an opportunity this week to warn someone. And let me, let me tell you, it's not easy. I, I identified with Paul what he says there at the end. I toil. Notice he says, I toil and I struggle with this. And it is a toil. It is a struggle. Just like Paul's expressing here. But what matters the most God wants you to get this. Settle for nothing less. To proclaim Christ. That is the numero uno calling in your life and my life. Paul is saying. As we've got the mystery. We've got the answer. We've got Christ in us. That no one else has on the planet. As a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it doesn't stop there. We proclaim Christ, but notice what he says. The greater purpose is we what? Help bring them to maturity in Christ. We don't just get them baptized and get them coming to church, but we are to be about helping them mature in their faith in Jesus Christ, to grow in their faith in Jesus Christ, to mature, to become fully mature, Paul says. So that's number two. Let's receive the privilege of proclaiming Christ. Amen? And what a wonderful privilege it is. And then number three, let's plan on the power of Christ. Look at verse 29. Again, look what he says. Of this, for this I told, not struggling, not struggling with, is it his energy? Whose energy? It's not his energy. It's, he says he, Christ's energy. With all Christ's energy that he powerfully works within me. So number three, let's plan on the power of Christ. So as we see the sufferings with Jesus for the joy that it is, and as we proclaim Christ, as we are focused on proclaiming Christ, let's plan how we do that. It's only on the power of Christ that we're able to do that. Amen? Look again. He's pro he says, proclaiming, not moderately. <laughs> he doesn't say moderately proclaiming or just when you feel like it. Or, or just whenever the urge hits you, he doesn't say that, does he? Just when the urge hits you to proclaim Christ. But what? It says powerfully works in you. So know that any time we open our mouths and our lips begin to speak the mysteries of, the, of, of Christ, and the mysteries of the gospel, guess what? The power of, he's saying the powerful will work, power will work in you. Powerfully will move in you. All powerful Christ because he's in you. He's taking up residence you. Christ is the hope of glory. That means hope in the future, as I said, but it means that glory, because Christ is in you, is built into you. Did you catch that? The glory that you're going to fully experience in heaven one day is built in you because Christ is in you. That's what he's saying. That glory is already there. You're a walking tabernacle of the living God. Think about that for a moment. You are a walking tabernacle of the living God. So much so that when you do his work, he adds strength. Every time you do the work of Christ, he adds strength. Isn't that amazing? That is so amazing. So let me stop and ask you a question at this point. What would happen if you just stopped saying no to Jesus and started saying yes to everything he sends your way? What would happen? You'd be amazed. You would be amazed. That's what would happen. And you would see God use you in incredible ways. When you begin to start saying yes to everything that he sends your way, when it comes to proclaiming Christ, when it comes to seeing all your sufferings for the joy that it is, as Paul said in his life. Do you, do you understand why Paul said that? Paul 
Remember what Paul was doing before he met Jesus on the Damascus Road? You remember what he's doing? What was he doing? Man, he was killing Christians. He was persecuting Christians. But then he met Jesus, and what did Jesus say to him? Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? How could Jesus say that to him? How was Paul persecuting him? Because Paul was persecuting the church. And the church and Jesus are one. Amen? And so when Paul persecuted the church, he was also persecuting Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what Paul understood. And that's why he's saying what he's saying here about see the sufferings with Jesus that you are going through for the joy that they are. That's a joy to go through the sufferings, right? That Jesus also experienced to a certain degree or to a great degree, actually. And so let's plan on the power of Christ. You know, the only way, it looks like, and I, I know some in this church, it looks like you are prioritizing that in your life. You know, I know Jim does, and I know a few others do. But it's not just reserved for Jim or reserved for ministers or me or, or staff members, Reggie. It's not just reserved for us to prioritize proclaiming the gospel, is it? No. It, the cost of, and, and, it, and I've seen it, cost to your bodies. Proclaiming Christ is going to bring cost to your bodies. When you, when you get weary and tired and yet God brings someone into your path and you've had a long day of work, maybe it's a co-worker in your, in your, at your job and you've had a long day of work, you've dealt with problem after problem after problem and all of a sudden God gives you an opportunity with that co-worker to proclaim Christ with them and you're like, oh, I don't feel like it. I'm tired. I don't want to do that. Do you understand what Paul is pointing out here? It's going to cost your body to do it. It's gonna, you're tired, you're weary from the long day, but it's going to cost you to walk in the sufferings of Christ. Amen? With the gospel, proclaiming the gospel message. Don't you know how to compliment? You know, have you ever complimented someone for their proclaiming Christ to someone? I, you're, that person's real. I tell people that I see in this church, when I see them proclaiming Christ, I say, you're real. With your body, I know that you're, you're putting in long hours, and yet you're still out there sharing the gospel. You know, you're talking to your neighbor after you've had a long day, and your neighbor happens to step out in the yard, and you're taking time out to talk with them, to proclaim Jesus with them. Do you see what Paul's saying? Wow. And I see it. I mean, what better way to, to serve the Lord with the cost, the personal costs that are going to come when it comes to proclaiming the gospel of Christ? And the only way to explain how the church is still on the planet, listen to me, the only way that I can explain why the church is still on the planet today is that Jesus Christ is able to add his powerful energy to a weak and frail person such as I and such as you. Amen? That's the only way that you, why the church is still here because Jesus is able to add his power to a weak vessel, frail vessel, all we got to do is what? Trust him. We just got to trust him. We do toil with the energy that Jesus provides is what Paul says. So here's my next question. What if you planned your future undertakings for Christ, not based on the strength that you have right now, but based on what Jesus was able to supply energy-wise to you? What would be like? What would that be like? What would happen? Wow. So let's plan on the power of Christ. So what's the takeaway from this passage? For us as a church, number one, we are creating the church of the future. Five minutes from now, we're building the church that we're going to be a part of and others are going to be a part of five minutes from now. And so those of you who are parents, you know this. When uh, you give birth to a child, when the, the woman gives birth to a child, the work has just begun, right? Uh, you toil. It doesn't stop at birth, but you continue, right, Mom, Dad? You continue, you continue to what? To raise them up. You continue to nurture them, to mature them. Same thing is true of the church. That's what Paul is saying. Paul would not be satisfied with a church full of people that were just being born again. He wouldn't be satisfied with that. He's going to be satisfied, and we should be satisfied with a church full of people born again in Christ but reaching full maturity in Jesus Christ. Amen? Full maturity. So where are you with that today? 
you know, God sees where you're at. Where would he put you on the scale? One to five. One being non-existent. You're not maturing at all. You're kind of stagnant. Five being, man, you're knocking, the, you're knocking a home run. You're knocking a, a grand slam. Maturing in Christ. Where are you with that? That's what God wants to see happen. God's going to be satisfied with nothing less than that in your life and my life. And he says we're going to suffer as we do it, as we mature in Christ. And he says be happy about it. Have you been happy with him, with it, the suffering you've gone through lately? That's what God's calling you to, to be happy, to see the sufferings with Jesus that you're going through and the joy that's connected with them. And so we're going to, it's going to mean we have to open our mouths for Jesus Christ, proclaim Jesus to people around us in our, wor in our work, in our neighborhood, in order for people to become mature in Jesus Christ. I can't do all the proclaiming, and I shouldn't. As the pastor, that's not, just, that's not my job only to do that. It's all of our jobs to proclaim Christ. I'm going to do my part. You have to do yours is what Paul is saying. So let's deeply accept what God will supply, his power. And so let's not plan based on obstacles. Oh, I don't know what to say or, or I'm afraid they're going to get mad at me. That's an obstacle that the devil wants you to have there to keep you from proclaiming Christ. Let's not let the obstacles get in the way, amen. Let's plan on the power of Christ. The strength that I have right now is not enough. The strength that God, Christ is going to give me is enough, is sufficient. Sometimes I wonder about this. Charles Spurgeon is one of my favorite theologians to study and to read, and even I quote him often. Uh, you know, he died at age 57. And if he had to do it all over again, he was a big man. He was, he, he was overweight. He was a big man. He ate things he shouldn't have eaten. If he had to do it all over again, would he not, and he smoked cigars, would he not smoke cigars and exercise? I don't know that he would. He led a lot of people to Jesus Christ. And I'm not telling you today how to care for your body. But here's what I'm saying. You're not on this planet to see how long your body can live. You are on this planet to lay your body down in service of Jesus. To lay your body down. Look what he says down there. To lay your body down in service with Jesus. To, to sacrifice your self-interest your self-desires, your self-absorption, your selfishness, that all about being a true follower of Jesus Christ is you deny yourself. What did Jesus say? If you're really going to be my follower, he said what? To the guys. Take up my cross, that's the suffering part, and follow me. And so Paul is emphasizing that as well in a different way, that our body is God's. It's the Lord. So let's give it to him. 